unless it was an emergency and I was out of the office or something. I uh, heard about it, remember it, you know, vaguely because it ultimately didn't become a major issue, but we certainly thought at the time that it would, and we're concerned for everybody involved. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, not something to hear about very often, and, and if I'm honest with you, as much as wrestlers drive, you would think it would be even more common than it is, you know, with, with so many of these guys, especially on the main roster, you know, driving 200, 300 miles a night, every night, between towns, you would think that this would be an even more common occurrence. And not to make light of this, or to sound like I'm somehow indirectly promoting it because it was cool, or it was the good old days, it was a horrible, horrible situation, and I'm not proud of it. But in addition to wrestlers driving you know, hundreds of miles late at night in between shots, there was usually a case or two of beer and any other, you know, imagine <laughs> narcotic or, or recreational uh, drug involved as well. And yeah, it's amazing that, you know, it didn't happen far more frequently with more devastating effects or, or consequences. Yeah, I mean, that's been around for a long time. I mean, Flair used to say that, you know, when he first broke in the business, you know, the vets would drive and, and obviously be drinking the entire time, but they would take their empty beer bottles and try to throw them at the street signs, you know, the on the highway or whatever. It was like a game, and it's just, it's weird how the business has changed so much from, you know, what used to be not just accepted, but sort of the normal, and, and now not so much. Well, and when you think about it, not to go so too far off track with this thought, but to, to keep this in context, you know, when I, the first time I came to Wyoming in 1977, I was 22 years old when I first came here, it was legal to drink and drive. You could literally pull up, and to this day, it's still true. You, not that you can drink and drive, obviously, but you could still pull up to a liquor store anywhere here in Cody, Wyoming, where I live, and they have drive through windows, just like a Burger King. You don't even have to go in the store. And back in the day, when I first started coming out here, if a cop pulled you over and you had a beer in your lap, that was cool. Now, if you were drunk if he suspected that you had had too much to drink he or she the officer could pull you out give you a dui but back then you know the the limit was like 0.15 you know now here in wyoming i think it's 0.07 or 0.08 and and that's just culturally across our country you know drinking and driving it's always been wrong it's always been dangerous but you go back 20 25 30 35 years go back to you know early parts of rick's career as as we've referenced it here um yeah cop pull you over you've had a couple beers gay okay, get home as long as you're not driving all over the road and you know putting yourself or somebody else in danger you know it's kind of like hey get yourself home you know get off the road as soon as you can now <laughs> it's a whole different world but you know, I think the lifestyle of wrestling back then, I think the lax you know, DUI laws and awareness, really it's awareness more than anything of how, just how dangerous it is. Um, it just it wasn't the case back then. But even in even at this period, in 1997, certainly DUI laws you know, had tightened up considerably, but the lifestyle hadn't really changed much, uh, hadn't really caught up with the change in the laws. So it's amazing not only that there weren't more accidents and, and devastating injuries, but it's amazing that you know, there weren't more people spending three or four days in jail over the weekend waiting for a judge to show up you know, and, and get a hearing. Because now you get pulled over now, at least where I live, you know, you're, you're there till morning, till you see a judge. So, um, could have created a lot, a lot more havoc back then. Let's just put it, put it that way. Well, let's talk about uh, some some news and notes behind the scenes. Scott Hudson is going to start the week of Spring Stampede as an announcer, uh, and he's going to be starting with the Saturday morning TBS main event show, and he's taking over Chris Cruz's spot. Uh, Chris Cruz and Scott Hudson are two names we don't hear about a ton anymore in wrestling. What can you tell us about each and why uh, Hudson took over for Cruz here? Because I really liked Scott Hudson. I, I, and I don't mean just personally. I did like him personally, by the way. And still do. He's a good guy. Uh, but I really loved... First of all, he was kind of on the Mark Madden side of the equation. He was involved in the, the wrestling publications. I can't remember who he worked for when I hired him. But he was clearly writing for somebody at the time. 
and i was in the frame of mind back then where, look, you're either going to be, you're either going to fight with them or you're going to make them a part of the process and i really experimented and you know i did with dave melser, i did with ray keller, i you know i did probably mostly with everybody that i could. there was a little bit of a period of time when i reached out and thought, all right, if i open this thing up a little bit it will eliminate the need for them to be taking pot shots from the sidelines about things they know nothing about or getting com completely wrong. So there was a period of time when I opened it up a little bit. Uh, and Scott was one of the guys that I opened up to that I just, I just really liked his energy. He was coming at, you know, the writing about, reporting about the wrestling business from a, uh, a positive perspective in a, you know, not not like you know, put people over that shouldn't be putting over. But his general tone didn't start with a negative narrative, which made him different to me than a lot of other people. And then, as I, because he used to come, Scott used to come to the TV tapings. He lived in Atlanta. He was in law enforcement in Atlanta, actually. Um, and he used to come to the TV tapings to cover what was going on. And I would talk to him there. I would engage with him. And I just. Yeah, summarize. I really dug his energy. I liked his voice. I liked the way he treated um, commentary. Um, Chris Cruz, there was nothing wrong with Chris. There was absolutely nothing wrong with Chris. But to me, Chris felt a little too cookie cutter, a little too much of a formula. He was he was playing it right up, straight up the middle, as he should, as he was trained, as he was encouraged to do, I'm sure. Uh, kind of like a sports caster would, without you know bringing a lot of personality to it. But it, that's not what wrestling needed, at, in my opinion, at that point. It's one of the reasons I like Tanae. You know, my Tanae was kind of out of that same mold, and Mark Madden, who we talked about last week. So I was looking for people. You know, whether they were writers, you know, Madden was a sports writer, uh, Hudson was was a wrestling writer, or it might have been PW Insider, I just can't, or Dave Shear at the time, I can't remember. But I, I was looking for people like him that were really immersed in it and were passionate about it, but were coming at it from a more positive perspective. And that's what I liked about it. Let's talk about um, the National Enquirer because it popped up with a story here that people talked about for a little while and every now and again we'll get a question about it on the show they ran a piece where they said that ray mysterio jr and jennifer aniston were perhaps romantically involved and Meltzer would say there's absolutely nothing to that it was just uh, an attempt which succeeded to get mysterio some publicity because wcw wants to push him big time do you remember this National Enquirer story, and, and was this some sort of leak that you guys did trying to get some buzz for it? No, it was the truth, and, and I'm and I'm shocked that Dave Meltzer would think or be so arrogant as to assume that he is so important, especially back then in the life of Ray Mysterio, that if little Ray Ray was tapping that Jennifer ass, that the first thing that Ray would do was call up Dave Meltzer and tell him about it, or confirm or deny it. Like, hang on, hang on. Look, Ray was living large. Ray was living really, really large at the time. He was over in the 619. And Jennifer Aniston had a little, you know, she liked a little Latin flavor in her life. Are you being serious right now? Fuck no. Okay. <laughs> God, you got me twice today already. Ah, I was just like, I'm on a roll. God damn. All right, can we get, can we put the misinformation on pause for a minute here? Because it's for a minute. Well, we're talking about Meltzer. You threw him into the equation. If we're going to bring Mel Meltzer's name up, right. National Enquirer in the same sense, we got to have a little fun with it. Well, I'm just saying, there's the, you know, there is a, a bit of a reputation out there that Ray Mysterio, once upon a time, was a ladies' man. And I've heard some other names from multiple sources where I was like, no way. But then when I saw this one, I was like, okay, now that one's bullshit. Tell me how this came about. I'm not sure. It, 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 I wasn't involved in it. I, I can't imagine it. Nobody in our office at that time, it would have probably been Alan Sharp. Um, he had the best contacts you know, outside of Atlanta. But I don't think Alan ever had a contact with National Enquirer because we never really engaged with him prior to that. We didn't engage with him after that. So it had to come somewhere. Um, or maybe they just made the shit up. You know, maybe, you know, who knows? They went to the Dave Meltzer School of Journalism and just figured, fuck it, we, we got to, we, we're at, we're at 8,250 words. We need more words. I know. Ray Mysterio's fucking Jennifer Aniston. Cool, run with it. 
I don't know. I don't know where it came from. Let's talk about uh, something you do know about a uh, an article that was published about the pro wrestling or the return of pro wrestling to the national consciousness. This came out on March 21st. And Sounds there's a, serious. There's a photo of Dennis Rodman and Hulk Hogan standing next to each other. And then there's quotes from both you and Vince McMahon. I know you'll have fun with this. Here's Vince's quote. Very simply, Ted Turner wants to put us out of business. He doesn't give a damn about the wrestling business and he doesn't give a damn about the fans. This is just a folly for Ted, a business venture. On the other hand, the WWF is a family business and we passionately care about our product. We invented the term sports entertainment and we redefined what this business is and isn't. It's like David and Goliath when you compare our resources to those of Time Warner. And I dare say the Time Warner cannot be pleased with the massive losses they are incurring in this venture. And you retort, we were profitable in 1995 and 1996. If Vince McMahon says differently, that's a blatant lie. And then you continued, Vince likes to cry about the deep pockets of Ted Turner and Tom Warner, but we're a publicly held company. I can tell you that they have more production staff, better production facilities, and a much bigger marketing budget. The difference is they don't have the talent. We do because that's where we spend our money. And McMahon replied, if Eric Bischoff says we spend more money in every area except talent, that's a blatant lie. They're willing to overpay for performers who are no longer in the athletic prime, and I have to operate in the real world. There's no way I could match the exorbitant guaranteed figures of a billionaire wanting to throw his money away, which I just find fascinating. So it's been a long time. Probably haven't seen or heard those quotes in 20 years or more. What do you think? It is fascinating, you know, and it, it, it was genius on Vince's part. And I, I don't throw that term around very often, but it's one of the things that Vince did right from the beginning. I mean, the minute he started, you know, his first reaction to us going head to head, head with him or, or hiring Hulk Hogan. Um, and here's, here's what's really interesting. If you go back and look at prior to Hogan coming to WCW, just prior, when, when the steroid, steroid trial was over, when Hulk Hogan got on the stand and denied that, that Vince McMahon sold him steroids or injected him or anything that when when hulk hogan said the opposite of what the government was hoping to hear and that trial was over vince mcmahon came out on the steps of the courthouse and buried hogan buried him after hogan had just basically said everything he he's everything that he said is probably you know had a lot to do with vince mcmahon be, being found not guilty um, the first thing that Vince did was go out and bury him. Why? Because he knew he was coming to WCW. Now, th- that to me is a very focused individual. It's not about personal. It's not about the truth. It's not about facts. It's what do I need to do to protect my business? I'll do whatever, say whatever, act however I need to in order to protect my, my family business. And I actually admire that in him. I do. I don't think I could do it. I don't think I have that. That I'm not wired quite that way. I'm, I may be close in some respects, but I don't think I could go as far as Vince did then, quite, quite honestly. Um, but it represents who I think Vince McMahon really was at that time, and he was fighting for his life. He was fighting for his however many generations. I think his great grandfather or might have been longer than that. You know, started the WWWWWWF, you know, back 